So here we are at the launch of Alder Lake, and it's architecture that combines both a main high IPC core architecture with a smaller core architecture meant to optimize for multi-threading performance per die space. I've been praising this fascinating approach Intel is taking to combine single and multi-threading performance into a smaller die than you would get otherwise if it was just big cores since February. And... Well, that's because Big Little isn't just about mobile efficiency. It's about giving you more in a smaller space. And frankly, my read of AMD's personnel from the recent five years of Ryzen video was that AMD was being caught a bit off guard by how well Alder Lake is turning out and that they seemingly didn't have that much to compete with a Big Little optimized approach for a while. But... You know, speaking of big from Big Little, I think it's worth pointing out some of the downsides to what's going on with Alder Lake and how big Golden Cove is. Whether you dig through Lacusa or Ian Cutress's analysis of Alder Lake, parts of Golden Cove, especially the cache, are big. I'm going to avoid going through the full analysis of what multiple people are saying and pointing to based on die shots because I believe... We should wait for a lot more die shots and analyses to come out from more people before I do so. But really, the long and the short of it is at this point that Golden Cove cores, depending on how you count what's required to be counted as a core, is about twice as big as a Zen 3 core. And, you know, when you say Golden Cove is the same size as four Gracemont cores, that makes Gracemont sound small. But when you think of it from the perspective of a Golden Cove core is twice as big as a Zen 3 core, well, Gracemont doesn't sound that magical, does it? Gracemont is just half as big as a Zen 3 core, and Zen 3 cores have hyperthreading. So from that perspective, you could almost argue that Intel had to go with a big little approach to make up for how... Frankly, some would say bloated the core architectures from Intel have gotten recently. Indeed, Zen has always been an architecture that brings impressive amounts of multi-threading performance into a smaller die size than its Intel equivalents. Even when you account for node advantages, which I'm not sure how much of one AMD has anymore with N7P over the latest Intel 7 10 nanometer node, uh, you'd go, well, you know, maybe AMD doesn't need to do that much to pack a ton of multi-threading performance into a smaller space. Maybe they don't need two core architectures. And in fact, when you look at APU flavors of their architectures, like Renoir for Zen 2 and Saison for Zen 3, you can say, wow, they even reduced cache by quite a bit while maintaining performance. Granted, that was a monolithic design that didn't need as much cash to make up for the latency penalties you get with a chiplet approach. But still, it, it points to what's possible from AMD when they optimize for less cash and trying to hit the same levels of performance in a smaller space. And when you think of it from that perspective, and then you look at that five years of rise in video, I'm starting to wonder if the worry in AMD is only that they didn't expect Alder Lake to pan out as well as it's going to, which frankly, we need third-party reviews to be sure of if it's really a true challenger to Zen 3. I, I still think we need to wait for those. But, but maybe AMD is just like, well, we didn't think Alder Lake would be this good, and so we're not that prepared to have them challenge us this holiday season. But after it, I don't know, from what I'm hearing... It might actually be Intel that should still be very worried about AMD taking ground from them and all forms of performance with their approach to big little. These are the products coming after Zen 3D and even Zen 4D. But before I talk about Zen 4D, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let me preface it by talking about this. In June, I was the first to leak details about AMD's 128-core Bergamo. This was the codename of the much-rumored 128-core Zen 4 product that everyone, including inside of Intel, was mocking up and talking about. You see, when I leaked Bergamo and its codename, there was a hornet's nest that was stirred up within AMD. Multiple sources of mine had to lay low for a while, and there was almost a witch hunt. And frankly, I don't understand why there was, or at least I didn't back then. I mean, come on, Naples had 32 cores, Rome had 64, Milan had 64. You would assume that AMD is going to have, doubling again, a 128-core product at some point. Is it really that crazy that I leaked something about, you know, more chiplets on an Epic product? 
Mm, no, if that's what it was. It turns out Bergamo is something much more than that. And now I understand why AMD was concerned about that leaking and why Intel should still be concerned about their ability to compete with AMD next year because the implications of what makes up Bergamo are far reaching bigger than just an epic product itself and i'm gonna leak details about zen 4d and even zen 5 soon but first an ad from a sponsor I am proud to say that Vite Ramen is a sponsor of Moore's Laws Dead. The Vite Ramen Company is an American company that pays its workers fair wages and engineered a tasty, healthy, and cheap meal that you can cook in less than five minutes. And these meals just got tastier with their updated version three of their ramen recipe. Meals aren't really healthy unless you keep coming back to eat the healthy ones. And that's what they've done with these updates to version three. Now is the best time to order some some Vite Ramen. So if you're busy, hungry, or just looking for a pre-made meal that isn't expensive, get some nudes sent to you. Click the link in the description and use the code BROKENSILICON to save 10% on your order. This helps me, this saves you money, and this supports a good company. Buy Vite Ramen today. All right then, let me stop dancing around what I'm leaking today. See this original Bergamo thumbnail that was on YouTube for a long time? This was simply a mock-up I did if they put more 8-core CCDs on an Epic Zen 4 chip. And, of course, you would assume it also had a different I.O. die, but it was just some, you know, guess to put something on a thumbnail. Back then, both me and Executable Fix had limited info on Bergamo, or at least I did. I always suspect he knows more than he's letting on on Twitter. Uh, but, anyways, I know he's starting to get more info, and so am I. I didn't get why AMD was freaked out internally over this back then, but now I do. This is the old Bergamo thumbnail, and it is now going to be replaced, if you check, by this new one. That's right, Zen 4D doubles the amount of cores per chiplet. I first heard this may be the case a couple weeks ago, but by now I've been able to confirm with three sources that this is the case. This is Zen 4D, Zen 4 Dense, and so I'm going to, well, I put together this video, and I'm now going to go through a slide confirming what I can confirm about Zen 4D at this time, and even what I can confirm about Zen 5. All right then, Zen 4D and Zen 5 early leak. So, Zen 4 dense information comes first. Zen 4D is a fork of Zen 4, with a completely redesigned cache system, stripped down features, and a reduced target clock speed for lower power consumption and increased density. It trades away some single core performance for massively increased multi-threading performance in a similar die space to a Zen 4 chiplet. And these chiplets are going to be used in Bergamo, which so far I believe launches by quarter to 2023. Although again, this is mostly confident. That's why if you look at the key, this is in white. It's not that I am not sure it will probably be out by then. It's just, it's too early to be 100%. But anyways, that's when Bergamo will probably be out and it will have 16 cores per chiplet. And one source points to half the L3 cache of Zen 4D versus Zen 4. And at the moment, it is still expected to have SMT2, but this isn't something I can 100% confirm yet. Although I got to say, when I consider the fact that Zen 4D is trying to give you a lot more multi-threading performance in a similar die space, and we can assume it will have lower clock speeds and less IPC than standard Zen 4, I feel like removing SMT2 would kind of almost defeat the purpose of Zen 4D. I mean, what? So what? let's say it's 20% less IPC and then maybe 10, 20% lower clock speeds. If you were to remove SMT2, I'm not sure this is, would really be any better per die space than Zen 4. So for now, I believe it still has hyper-threading, which is very impressive when you consider how many threads are being packed into a similar size chiplet. And I cannot also confirm if it removes or partially removes AVX 512 support, but that wouldn't surprise me considering Genoa will be sold next to Bergamo with fully accelerated AV AVX 512 and that there are reports coming out right now that the AVX 512 components of Zen 4 take up a lot of die space. You know, I reached out to a few server contacts of mine, some at AMD, some at Intel, and some outside of there. I'm going to show a few quotes from some of them, not going to say, of course, where these people work, but here's what they said about removing AVX 512 on Bergamo, if it made sense in their opinion. 
First source says, if it was up to this person, they would trade AVX 512 support for massively increasing general multi-threading performance within the same power consumption because most of this person's workloads don't benefit from AVX 512. And even half of the ones that do end up using a ton more energy in the process. So the benefit isn't that great. Basically, this person said, I would definitely just increase multi-threading performance by 50% or more if it used the same energy. That would be a greater benefit to me almost always than having AVX 512 for the few workloads that we need for these, uh, this instruction set for. And the second source says, well, wanted to remind me that AVX 512 support isn't an all or nothing premise, right? You could claim to have basic support without using up nearly as much die space as natively supporting it with maximum performance benefits. Basically, for example, you could double pump 512 tasks into a 256-bit pass. There's no real benefit, but also very little downside to having to occasionally run AVX 512 code. Now, that's important because AVX 512 was disabled on Golden Cove in Alder Lake because of issues with what happens if you send an AVX 512 instruction to the little cores that can't support it, that Intel wanted to include it on the big cores, but lasered it off once it was validated because they just didn't feel like they could get it up and running. This would allow you to run big cores with 512 and little cores with 512 at the same time. The little cores wouldn't get as much of a, really any benefit from running 512, but at least you can still combine the multi-threading AVX 512 performance. Finally, the third source said that the server market is at the start of a great bifurcation between hyperscale and everything else. And that this person thinks that cloud and hyperscale customers, which you will remember is what I said a while ago this is meant for, it would make sense for them to have a separate family that packs this many low power cores into as small a space as possible. And, and he pointed out that, you know, Bergamo and Geno will be sold at the same time. So you can have a server with sockets that have well, whichever one you want and send the right task to the right node with Bergamo or Genoa. So that's what I have to say about 512. I did put some thought into it. And um, also the number of DDR5 channels is unconfirmed for me for Bergamo. But to my knowledge, talking to a couple engineers at these companies, there's no reason an IO die couldn't be designed that supports the same 12 channel DDR5 over eight times Zen 4D chiplets as, you know, what is it? The, uh, I believe it's 12 chiplets times eight that you have with 96 core Genoa. And so, yeah, there's also then, if you ask me, no reason why you couldn't have an AM5 IO die be designed to support dual channel DDR5 for two chiplets. Now, this is speculation or really just me asserting a scenario. This is not me confirming I've been told this. But if they can do what we're seeing here with Bergamo, I have no reason to believe that AMD could not launch a 2 times 16 core, a 32 core Zen 4D product on AM5. Perhaps, I don't know if they're going to call Zen 3D the 6000 series, but assuming it's the 7000 series, perhaps they'll call it like a R97965WX that launches in quarter one after the main Zen 4 architecture, after Raphael. For those that want kind of Zen 3 IPC and double the cores, and don't just want the IPC increase. To me, this is an ingenious way to make AM5 great for basically all consumers, the people that want truly a pseudo WX Threadripper system for less money and those that want that extra IPC. And I've also been told something even more exciting. Zen 5 is expected to use the Zen 4D architecture as its little cores. Let's start talking about Zen 5 then, huh? So Zen 5 is stated as being a much more exciting architecture than Zen 4 by numerous sources. Think of Zen 4 to Zen 5 as analogous to the enthusiasm we felt going from Zen or maybe Zen Plus to Zen 2. The current target, and this is even more exciting in my opinion, for a launch is quarter 4, 2023. So in other words, 11 to 14 months after Zen 4. Zen 4 is taking a lot of work laying the ground for AM5, getting the architecture up and running on, you know, uh, TSMC's 5 nanometer process. Once that's out, expectedly around quarter 3, 2022, about a year later, so probably quarter 4, 2023, is when Zen 5 should launch. And the architecture is, just to be clear, expected to bring at least a Zen 4 IPC increased over Zen 4. So if Zen 4, think about that, brings a 25% IPC increase over Zen 3, Zen 5 is expected to do at least that over Zen 4. I mean, we're talking about 50, 60% higher IPC at the end of 2023 than what we have right now. And 
Desktop Zen 5 is currently planning to consist of eight of those insanely high IPC Zen 5 cores plus 16 cores of Zen 4D that can be back sourced to the previous node to dual source for Big Little. This is AMD's answer to Big Little. And it is also expected, as I've said in a recent video, expected to offer more specialized accelerators like neural engines as standard on some products. So yes, I am excited about Golden Cove and Gracemont, but at this point, I'm starting to get even more excited about the big little architectures AMD is going to do with Zen 4D within Zen 5. Like, frankly, if you think about Zen 4D, it sounds like perfect for a PS5 Pro if it's launching by, oh, that's right, the end of 2023, or for a Van Gogh successor for the Steam Deck 2. But to me, in the short term, the most interesting product is a, let's call it again, a 7965WX that AMD could launch to complement standard Zen 4 at the end of next year. And that's because I think it would be a perfect chip to make no one really care that much about Raptor Lake or make fewer people care and compete effectively, right? After all, Raptor Lake sounds very impressive, having 10% higher single core performance over Golden Cove in its big cores and then doubling the little Gracemont cores. But I don't know if anyone will care if this is competing with a 16 core Zen 4 that beats or at least roughly competes at the same level of performance in games while using far less energy, probably on a cheaper platform. And then at the same time, AMD launches a 32 core that crushes Raptor Lake and multi-threading performance while using less energy. Look, I think the future is multiple core architectures being combined, but I still feel like next year in 2022, most people will either want the raw core performance and up to 16 cores of it that you get from an all big core architecture or as much multi-threading as they can get get. And again, I don't know how much lower the single threaded performance is for Zen 4D over Zen 4 or under Zen 4, I guess you might actually say. But I guess I'll say this about that, right? I kind of really haven't said anything yet. I've heard estimates for Zen 4D as being 10% lower IPC or, or, or as high as 40% lower. So let's just assume it's like 30 or 25%. That would still be pretty close to Zen 3 performance. So people that make do with 32 cores of Zen 4D on AM5, because really they need the multi-threading workloads more than gaming performance, they'd still probably be gaming as well as, I don't know, a Zen 2 Plus or a slightly underclocked Zen 3 processor. You're still doing 120 hertz. And if Zen 4D is just 10 to 20% less performance than standard Zen 4, that's still pretty close to Zen 3D performance. So I don't know who would be complaining about having the equivalent of 32, you know, Zen 3D cores, which on the note of Zen 3D, which in that case isn't dense, is just 3D stacked vCache, Vcache is a wild card for these D dense architectures that I'm not sure how it will affect it, right? You know, if the if a large part of the IPC decrease in Zen 4D is the fact that it has significantly less cache, could you still pack 32 cores into an AM5 processor, put Vcache over it, and have most of the same IPC as Zen 4? I, I honestly don't know, but there's a lot of implications to what AMD's doing here. And then combining the other things they're working on, like Vcash, that people should start thinking about. And that makes me just have to say that I'm not really worried about AMD competing with Intel next year or the year after anymore. It may be too early for me to be sure of the IPC or the exact power consumption of Zen 4D at this point, but it's not too early for me to say that I think this will compete well with Intel, and that this seems like a far more interesting and possibly more efficient and intelligent idea than literally having two entirely separate core architectures with separate teams that Intel has working on that need to be combined. That's way more complicated, way more expensive. The idea that I think we can assume AMD will just take Zen 4, then Zen 5, then Zen 6 and fork it off and make dense versions of each architecture is Frankly, common sense when you consider how much more node shrinks are favoring the core logic shrinking over shrinking the cache. This is honestly common sense. And then, my God, the implications of this go far beyond compact APUs and big little on AM5. I mean, consider that 
Well, I've been told that right now AMD is working with Microsoft on immersive cooling solutions for 600 watt plus cooling for mega epic chips. And that executable fix himself has been mentioning turret so Turin socket supports up to 600 watts with 256 Zen 5 cores. So if Genoa is 96 Zen 4 cores and Bergamo's 128 Zen 4D, I think that's a tiny start. If Turin goes up to 256 big Zen 5 cores, who's to say a Zen 5D might not pack 512 or maybe quadruple 1,024 little cores that trade maybe two-thirds of the die being cash for just packing in a ton more cores? And yeah, I think it's safe to say that we know that Intel's probably working on hyperscaler and cloud architectures for server that are all little cores. To me, that sounds like those are going to have a hard time competing with a 512 core, 1024 thread Zen 5D chip in a few years. I think that's probably going to be a tall order for Intel. And I stick to Intel probably not really being in the lead until 2025 or later for now. And again, just to be clear, Bergamo and the D architectures that come after it won't just be there to combat Intel. Remember what I said in my Bergamo leak, that the internal documents at AMD showed that Bergamo was meant to actually not really compete with Intel so much as ARM and Apple server chips, that they would be the main competition of Bergamo. Well, since then, I can now say this. I can 100% confirm that Apple is making its own server chips. At first, probably for itself, but in the future, who's to say? Apple is entering the server market. And all of this is to say, when we look at Bergamo, Raptor Lake, Zen 4D, Zen 4, Zen 5, and Apple entering the server market, <laughs> the next few years are going to be fascinating to cover for me. And I, I hope you subscribe to my channel to not miss those videos because, well, that's going to just about do it for this one. Again, please subscribe to the Moore's Laws Dead YouTube channel. Ring the bell button so you don't miss my upcoming videos. Of course, I'm going to have videos on Alder Lake and podcasts coming out with special guests discussing what we think about it. You don't want to miss that. And, you know, also, if you have the extra money, consider supporting Moore's Laws Dead on Patreon. It pays me, pays Gerard, pays Dan. We're trying to expand the team to do more renders to get a hold of more products. I, I just, we really could use the extra support. It's been stagnating, to be honest, lately, and I'm not sure what to do about that because you guys get so much exclusive ad-free content on the Patreon that no one else even gets access to that's tailored just to what the patrons vote for and ask for. But anyways, all of that's there if you have the extra money. No matter what, if you made it this far, as always, thank you for watching. <laughs>